This is one of the first photographs of me when I was born. I was born 14 weeks premature. I want to share with you the story of how against all odds, I survived. Because I was born so early, it attracted media attention across the whole country. I wanted to learn more about the day I was born, so I decided to sit down with my mum and chat about the experience. When you did come out, I thought you were dead and your gran said, because she saw you being born and she said, he's, he's breathing, I think he's breathing. And you were literally lifted and taken away and you didn't cry. Yeah. There was no noise at all, it was just silence. It was horrible. Aye, it wasn't very nice. Everyone surrounding me, including the doctors, were unsure if I was going to make it through the night. They basically just tell you to take every day as it comes. Um, if you get a good day, it's a bonus. E expect, expect the worst, really, and anything else you know you can build on. And basically, that was all that that we did. We did, we never, we never got carried away because we always knew that. You know, there would be days you, you would go in and you, you'd be doing really well and we would think, right, okay, he's coming on. And then the following day, or even hour to hour, that would change and you'd be phoned at home and you'd have to come back through and a, you had a really bad, ropey, you know, 40 hours they said was critical. Yeah. And that was, basically I stayed in the hospital and then I decided to go home that day. I think it was, you were born on a Friday and I went home on the Monday yeah. and I, I left that hospital and I knew and they hit, they phoned and said you're going to need to come back, Nick's taking a turn, Nicholas is taking a turn for the worst and we came back and they said that you weren't going to live that day, you wouldn't live the day and did we want to put in any, any procedure like, did you want baptised, yeah. you know, that did type of thing and we got baptized, the, so. the the, the priest thing. actually came and he performed all the different religious mm. things that go along. But I would be totally lying to you, Nicholas, if I told you I could remember a lot of it because mm. I was pretty distressed. In order for me to survive, I had to have immediate heart surgery at just three weeks old. This operation could have easily have killed me. So I know I had a lot of operations in that one as well. Could you mm -hmm. tell me about them? Yeah, well you actually didn't have that many. No. You had one. No, the one, I one. Too. No. You had one and it was on your heart. Yeah. And you know, you you've got a big scar yeah. that's grew with you yeah. and like the surgeon just tied off the wee duct. It was a tiny thing. And you you were great after that. That was one of the reasons why that you you were ventilated and one yeah. of your breathing they couldn't wean you off this ventilator. You were very, very dependent on it. And that was one of the reasons why. And once that was repaired, you, you started to progress a bit better. Your feeding started to get a bit better, and things started to to look a lot better. Yeah. I think, if I remember right, you were three weeks old. Mm -hmm. I think when they done that, yeah. but that getting you to the, that three weeks was quite hard because they had to get you stable for that operation because they, they couldn't give you that yeah. unless they'd got you fairly yeah. stable. Because I was so small. Any surgery that was necessary for me to be kept alive was becoming a challenge for the doctors. There's a scar on my foot as well, look, what's that? That like? was a, you had lots of different lines and all, you probably have noticed over the years you've got scars in your hands. Aye, I do, uh, And you've got scars all up here. Pretty much, aye. That's like wee, wee, wee dots. Tiny, uh, that was wee because, endings. because you were so premature they couldn't get a vein. Oh, yeah. And it was very, very difficult to get a vein on you. And when they did get a vein, it never kept for very long, yeah. you know, they don't it's keep the collapse so yeah. and that was what happened there, the, the, yeah. the line. Did that screw as well, that's massive. Yeah, like the line tissued in your foot yeah. and you had a, a great big hematoma and then that was why it scarred so bad. Yeah. And things are, practice is very different now because yeah. you wouldn't, so you'd be like, that, like that, you used to get a line in it was all bandaged up yeah. and like you, it was like you never, you didn't go near it oh, yeah. in case you lost the line and you needed to get your medication into you. It's very important to have these lines. Oh, yeah. But now it's expected that you check these oh, things yeah. because this is what happens. Kids, oh, yeah. they like lose feet and, oh, yeah. you know, you get terrible scarring and oh, stuff. Yeah. It's very dangerous. It's I know, you're very lucky. Oh, yeah. You're very lucky. 
an unborn baby's brain quadruples in size between 24 and 40 weeks of pregnancy. Being born at 26 weeks, my body still had a lot of growing to do. I suffered a bleed to the brain and the outcome could have been horrific. That was about, I think it was 40, uh, 40 hours after you were born and it's, it's quite common. But like that, it's, it's common, they tell you that it, it's common and to, it's, expect it, but when it happens to you, mm. it's pretty terrifying and you were not expected to live after that. After being through so much, I eventually got home and things were starting to look up, but things took a turn for the worst. I got you home in September weekend and it was just the best feeling in the world. It, me and your dad were like a family and it was fabulous and we brought you home and you were well for about two weeks but you were on oxygen because that was the only way we could bring you home because you were a nightmare to get off the ventilator. So this was the best situation that we could aim for and we brought you home and things were going well. But we were told that any subsequent infections that you picked up, yeah. viruses, anything like that, would have a, quite a profound effect on you. And you were literally home for weeks and you had your first infection and that was you and more antibiotics and another one and another one. And then I think it was the November that you took a respiratory illness called RSV mm. and I would be really struggling to try and pronounce but, and that was pretty serious for you. Uh, a normal full term baby can be pretty ill with this yeah. condition. But children who are born premature or have a heart defect or anything like that really get hit hard with it. Mm. And that was what happened to you. And you ended up ventilated again as a result of yeah. having RSV. How long was I on that? You were ventilated for a fortnight. So, I'm in the hospital again. so your first Christmas was yeah. spent in York Hill, <laughs> not with me. No. Nope. Soon after spending my first Christmas at York Hill Hospital, I eventually got home. Although I was still connected to an oxygen tank for some time to allow me to breathe. I think there's always been a sense of concern for you. Mm. I think all oh, you know as you as you grew. You know, where did you walk? You walked. How's his speech? Never sure. Well, well, we had to take you to a speech therapist. Aye, uh, I remember that. You know, how is he going to achieve well at school? Is he going to be able to what? cope in, in mainstream school? Because uh, it was always a, you know, a debate whether or not you would possibly have to go to special needs uh, school. Did you not have to fight for that? Well, there, it was always a bit debatable whether or not, but. You know, you started to meet all the, your milestones that you were expected to meet for your age and I think everybody just realised that you were holding your own, you know, mm -hmm. you, you were never going to be, you were never the top of the class or the first to write your name, and, yeah. but people just had to give you a bit of time and I just always stressed to mm -hmm. the teachers and different people in your life that this was what was going to need to happen, but yeah. for you to meet your full potential was just to give you a bit of time yeah. and and I think it, it's stood you in good stead and yeah, I do. It cost the government £29,000 on average to keep just one premature baby alive in its first year. It cost £2,700 on average to keep a full term baby alive with no complications for the first year. My mum goes on to make an interesting point. Should money determine whether a baby lives or dies? I think it, it, it's a lesson. You know, there's a big debate now about what's the right age to, uh, you know, to save a, a life. Mm -hmm. And that there's, you were born 20 years ago, but there's many, many children being born every day, premature, and you can't put a, a, you know, a, a price on it. I know it's costing the government lots of money to keep kids alive, but you have sometimes you have really, really positive outcomes, yeah. and I think every child deserves a, a, a chance, chance at least. Yeah. I do. Although I remember only a small percentage of my early life, I don't remember a lot, 
So it's always hard for me to imagine what my family went through when I was born. I can't thank my family enough, in particular my mum and dad, for sticking by me when I was born and allowing me to accomplish some great things in life so far.